Okay. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Grab your hymn books. Hymn number 223, Springs of Living Water. Let's all stand and sing hymn number 223. I thirsted in the barren lands of sin and shame, and nothing satisfying there I found. But to the blessed cross of Christ one day I came, where springs of living water did abound.
33 on that second verse. How sweet the living water from the hills of God. It makes me glad and happy all the way. Now glory, grace, and blessing mark the path I trod. I'm shouting hallelujah every day. Drinking at the springs of living water. wonderful afternoon. It sure is good to be back tonight. Looking forward to the preaching of God's Word. We're going to start with a word of prayer. Brother Sean McGonigal, if you would, sir, please lead us in prayer tonight. Father, thank you for, Lord, this day, and Lord, we thank you for your Word, and Lord, we pray that you would bless this time together as we look into your Word and learn more about music. We pray that you would be honored with all that's said and done here tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Please be seated. It is good to be here. It's the last uh, service of our church anniversary celebration. It's been 25 years since we've been here in the state of New Jersey. We'll be uh, celebrating a couple more anniversaries coming up in the next couple years, including the one two years from now as we'll be celebrating 25 years of our church organization. And that'll be coming up. Um, this is 2023. And so uh, time ticks on. And so it's wonderful to be able to have this celebration with the Schaefer family and the Schaefers who are with us. Uh, that first year that we were here. As a matter of fact, it was September of 1996 when the, uh, Brother and Mrs. Schaefer and I and their daughter also came out uh, for the services and uh, Brother Schaefer preached. We were in the old building. I don't, you know, we really haven't driven by there uh, since you've been here. I, we, I didn't think about that the other day when we were in the borough. The, the building's gone. They plowed it under, widened the road. And, uh, but after we moved out, a Chinese restaurant moved in became Lim Fong's Chinese restaurant, it went from church roll to egg roll, that's what I always said, and uh, it was there for a good number of years until they, uh, until the county widened uh, the, the road there, and so there's, there's nothing there now, but we were in that building for about a year's time, and then this building became available, of course I shared with you that Brother Schaefer was here in town when we got the phone call about this facility. Do you remember much about that uh, day we came in there, looked at the building? Yeah, and so we, we came over, looked at the facility. Brother Hammett came over from Lehigh Valley. Uh, we talked with the pastor who was here at the time. They were about ready to sign the building over to a realtor uh, in order to get rid. They were under, they had uh, some debt they couldn't pay, and they were just down to a handful of folks, and they needed to get rid of the facility in order to pay off debt. And so, uh, you know, we, we worked out a deal, and so we were, uh, we were about a month's time between the, uh, the day that we met with them um, and then worked out all the arrangements, and uh, we began to meet here in this building in November of 96. It was, I believe, like right before, maybe the Sunday before Thanksgiving or something like that. It wasn't long after that, and so uh, we didn't have to do much to it. The building was just the way it was. Where they, had, uh, they left all the tables and chairs and a lot of the Sunday school materials and a lot of equipment and we had our sound equipment, which consisted of a little board about that big and a couple knobs on it. We probably still have it somewhere, and uh, it, was, um, it was a great blessing. The Lord uh, really provided for us as we were a growing ministry. We had three families that we started with, and immediately uh, after we started meeting over in Pemberton in the building over there, uh, two other military families joined us uh, almost immediately, uh, the Ambroses. Uh, Brother Andy, of course, was civilian, but uh, he was, uh, got moved here by his business, and he, found, he heard about our ministry and joined our ministry very soon after that, and 
We had a couple other families uh, in the Pemberton area that joined with us, and then other military families were checking us out. And, and um, I believe one of the services that we had during that revival service, uh, when Brother Schaefer was here, we had about 70 people uh, on one of those nights. It was the highest attendance we had ever had. And you could imagine if you, and I, I mentioned this the other night, so the seating area that you had, now we didn't have pews, we had like folding chairs for most of the time, and we would have, we would have been about, about this dimension right here, and uh, we packed 70 people in there to hear the preaching that night, and so uh, it, was, uh, it was interesting, and so uh, we really enjoyed it. Uh, I don't know if you remember, uh, several of nights afterwards, we walked down to the Dunkin' Donuts, which was just down the street, and uh, we were doing some singing. I think you were involved. You were probably the one to probably spurred us on to be singing in the Dunkin' Donuts, but uh, it was an enjoyable time, some good preaching, and uh, it was a wonderful time of fellowship as we uh, really celebrate how, uh, how the Lord was blessing. The church was growing very quickly at that time, and uh, uh, God has done some great things uh, here at New Testament Baptist Church, and we're all uh, we're all excited because uh, the Lord just continues to do good things uh, through the New Testament Baptist Church. And I want to thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for helping with uh, the celebration all throughout this week. And I pray the Lord will bless you with the preaching of his word tonight. The only announcements I have is to make mention of the fact that there is a ASL class on Wednesdays. That's uh, uh, 2 o'clock on Wednesdays. If you have any questions, you certainly speak to the McGonagall's about that. They take care of that ASL, American Sign Language class. And also, uh, men's prayer coming up this Saturday. So, fellas, you can join us here at the church at 7 o'clock. We do a short devotion and then have a time of prayer together. And uh, please come and join us uh, on Saturdays for that. Um, let's see here. We have a memory verse, and then we're going to go over. Uh, it's the last Sunday of the month, and you all know what that means. We get to celebrate some birthdays and anniversaries. Birthdays, and uh, I, that's how I spell it. Anyway, Brother Stephen, this is our. This is the last opportunity. This is it. So uh, memory verse time, Brother Stephen. Thank you so much. Thanks, Pastor. Okay, one last time, Colossians 3.13. Colossians 3.13. And if you're there, you can read that nice and loud with me. It says, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Colossians 3.13. If you were on a roll this morning, if there's anybody left who still hasn't done it yet, wants to do it, one last chance, now's your chance. Rachel? Forgive one another and forgive one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. Got it. Yes. All right. Good job, guys. I have a new verse Thursday. October birthdays, come on up here. We have a few. Hayden had a birthday in the month of October. Congratulations, Hayden. How old are you nowadays? 11 years old. Hello, Helen. How are you? I heard you say your memory verse this morning. You did really well. She is 18. Oh my. I know. Wow is right. Yes. Hey there, how are you? You're a teenager, right? What, what, what's, what's, where, where are we at teenager-wise? 14. Oh, my. Hi. Yeah, that too. These guys share a birthday, by the way. And so, uh, all righty. Anyone else? Any other birthdays? 
You guys ready? You guys ready? Here we go. Sing another song, Tom. All right. Yeah. 236, grab your hymn books. 236, no, not one. In 236, let's all stand. We'll sing. There's not a friend like the holy Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else can heal all their souls' diseases. No, not one. It's a blessing to have Brother Schaefer with us. I do want to mention again about the CDs that he has available. It's a CD he was able to put together and uh, some beautiful songs. If you'd like to uh, get that, uh, Brother Carlos, I believe, still has them. They're $15 each. And also, I do want to make mention one more time about love offering. We do extend the love offering to our guest speaker. And if you'd like to contribute to that, you're welcome to do that. I would, I would just ask you, please, take care of that immediately after the services. And inevitably, what happens is, you know, about uh, about uh, you know hours after this meeting's done and our guest speaker's gone out the door and flying back to who knows where, somebody will say, "Oh, I threw a couple dollars in the offering plate. Can you make sure he gets it?" Well, yeah, we'll do that, but it's a whole lot easier if you take care of it right away. So please, uh, and you can write out a check if you're doing that to the church or just indicate on a, on the offering envelope. And uh, we'll get that squared away. So thank you for that uh, ahead of time for your generosity. 
towards our guest speaker. We certainly have had a great time, not only with the preaching of God's word, but some great fellowship and, uh, and sitting around the table together, having some meals and just enjoying some great times together. And it's been a blessing. Thank you so much, brother. And uh, Brother Schaefer has been blessed with some, uh, some great uh, abilities in music uh, that has been reflected in the ministry that he's had there in North Dakota. And I've heard some of the music that's come out of there. Uh, it's been a blessing to, to hear that. Um, but also, of course, Brother, Brother Schaefer has had opportunities of teaching uh, at the Bible College there in Fargo. And part of that, of course, is instructions in music also. And so he's going to be talking about some of those things today. I still remember that first time that he came to New Testament Baptist Church and, uh, and preached uh, our, that revival service back in 96. He taught us a chorus and I, it's, it's still locked in my head. It's been 25 years, and that's, that chorus has been locked in my head for the last 25 years. Are we? Eh? So I won't ruin it by trying to sing it, because we all know that I don't follow, I don't read music. Okay? Anyway, so um, it, it, um, I, I remember that so well from back then. Um, and so I'm looking forward to, he, to hearing uh, what the Lord has for us concerning music tonight. So, Brother Schaefer, if you would. I think it's the same key that we start both songs, so that, uh, that could be real beneficial. Uh, so let's first of all take our Bibles, turn to Psalm one, excuse me, Psalm ninety-two, <clears throat> Psalm ninety-two, and everybody should be kind of in your mind. You're kind of humming that note. Is it still? It it is. What's what's the note, ladies? Ladies, help us out. La. So oh. gentlemen, we'll drop it down to. Yes, got sir. A microphone problem. Really? Yeah. Yeah, so if you move around, you lose you all the yet. Yeah, it is a little bit. Just like that. There you go. Hmm. You're live. <clears throat> I don't know who, who shut it off, but uh, I'll try not to, to get my, my feelings hurt over that. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. <clears throat> Amen? Psalm, uh, Psalm 92. Uh, and for some odd reason, I'm going to have to hit that note again because it just sounds like <clears throat> la, but that's not it. It really is, isn't it? La, it. Are you ready to sing Psalm 92? Here we go. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing. Praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning, and thy faithfulness every night. Upon an instrument of ten strings, and upon the psaltery, upon the harp with a solemn sound. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. And to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. To show forth thy loving kindness in the morning, and thy faithfulness every night, and thy faithfulness every night. <clears throat> How many of you song leaders um, that are out there believe you can do that on Thursday? Lead that song. Yes, sir. That's one. Where is Tomas? All right. So the song leaders have to be able to, to lead that. <clears throat> and uh, I think you'll do well. But like I said, uh, depending on how long the service goes, it'd be nice to be able to sing it again at the end of the service. But I believe um, Pastor Shorter said, I, I need to be done no later than 830. So that's just a little over two hours from now. So we might be able to go over that again. 
Oh, wait a minute. That's when we start at 7. Excuse me. All right. So let's go ahead and turn over to Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah chapter 51. And uh, Isaiah 51 and verse 11, we just call the song, Therefore the Redeemed. Therefore the Redeemed. So uh, Isaiah 51. And uh, when was the last time uh, you sang this in church? Oh, it's been a while. Okay. So um, let's see. Therefore the redeemed. Here we go. It goes like this. I'll sing it through once, and then everybody gets to sing along after that. Here we go. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. Now, accompanist. Uh, I think the uh, accompanist here are gifted enough that you can put together a couple notes, maybe three, maybe four, maybe complete chords, and come up with an accompaniment for these songs. Or you can do what everybody else does, Google it, and it'll probably come up. All right? So everybody sing along this time. Notice, we sing, Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. But we turn right around and sing it again. Then we sing, they shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Then we finish up again with, therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. And once you get a little proficient with it, you can go ahead and repeat certain portions of the song. But just for now, let's see if we can get through it. Amen? All right. Uh, is it going to be there? Was that a little bit high that last time? Therefore. Okay, sing along if you can. Here we go. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy. And sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. Amen. Uno mas tiempo or are we good? Let's see if we can get through the end of the service and come back and see how much I remember, all right? <clears throat> so it's good to be with you. This is the, the last service. Six messages uh, goes by very quickly. My wife and I were saying, by the time you get to Sunday afternoon, you realize this went by very, very fast. And so once again, I want to express my appreciation for being invited to be with you during this portion of the an anniversary celebration. It's really nice. I think Pastor Shorter loves to celebrate anniversaries. So if you piecemeal the anniversaries out, you can make them last forever. Yeah. Especially if somebody gets married just two weeks ago. Man, you've got these anniversaries down. 
And so tonight we want to take a look at music, and music is obviously a fantastically large <clears throat> topic. So there's all sorts of information written and all sorts of information online that has to do with music. And so I'm taking basically three different messages, seminar messages, that I have taught and preached, and I'm just condensing them down to four hours so that we can just cover them all tonight. Now, aren't you glad you're saying to myself, to yourself, I hope he's kidding, I hope he's kidding, I hope he's kidding, and I am. So we're going to do our best, we're going to pray, and then we're going to jump right into the message for tonight. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful again for you allowing us to gather together. And Lord, we ask that you would bless, that you would instruct and edify your people this evening from the passages of scripture that will be read, the principles of music, the philosophy of music that will be stated. And Lord, I ask that you will help us to go away better uh, informed concerning music in the Lord's church uh, than when we first came in tonight. And we'll give you the praise and the thanks for all that you do in our hearts. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to start off with 1 Chronicles chapter 6. If you'd like to start there, 1 Chronicles chapter 6. We're looking at some elements of uh, biblical philosophy uh, as it relates to the area of music. Uh, many times... We think of one of the goals of music is this, how can we have true, spirit-led, spirit-filled music that, among other things, helps prepare hearts for the preaching of God's Word? Because it would be nice if the music prepared our hearts, or at least helped prepare our hearts, uh, for the preaching of God's Word. So when we look at that, it all starts with the persons who are in charge of selecting the music and, of course, choosing the music to be sung. <clears throat> and whoever, whatever the person's name is, uh, whatever their title is, really is irrelevant. It's a matter of you, we need to be concerned about what does the Bible say about this. So in 1 Chronicles chapter 6, you'll notice that there's actually a title given in 1 Chronicles chapter 6. I think it's a good name that's given to the idea of music. And I want you to notice it in 1 Chronicles chapter 6 and there in verse 31. And these, the Bible says, and these are they whom David, that's of course King David, set over the, next three words everyone, service, service of song. Isn't that a good name? The service of song. And in other words, it is a ministry it is a service that is rendered to God to be of benefit and blessing to God's people. And that's basically what this is all about. And setting over the service of song in the house of the Lord. Well, what is the, uh, what is the church? Uh, this just happens to be the house of the Lord. We are, we are a blood-bought body of Christ. And uh, this is the house of the Lord. This is where we meet together, and the place has been set apart for the worship and service to the Lord. In the same way that the uh, Hebrew uh, te uh, temple was set apart and sanctified for sacrifice and service to the Lord, in the same way the house of the Lord, the Lord's church tonight, is set aside for serving the Lord, and that includes the service of song. I'll mention it now. The service of song should not be the predominant thing that is present in the Lord's church. However, at the same time, if the service of song is done properly and scripturally, it will enhance everything else that is done in the house of the Lord ministering to the Lord, and worshiping the Lord. So <clears throat> the service of song can either contribute to the service and worship of the Lord in its entirety, or it can detract from the service and worship of the Lord. 
So 1 Chronicles chapter 15, if you'll turn there, these are just uh, Bible philosophy stated in really just a few, few words here. In 1 Chronicles chapter 15, we're going to look at verse 22 when you get there. 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 22, the Bible says, And Chenaniah, chief of the Levites, was for song. He instructed about the song because he was skillful. Now, the song here refers to all the songs that were, were presented in the temple, really to God and for the, we'll find out later, edification and instruction of God's people. <clears throat> so, Chenaniah, chief of the Levites, was for song. By the way, they had a Hebrew hymn book, and it's probably been stated to you before. We get to hold the Hebrew hymn book. It's, it's within our Bible. It's the book of Psalms, and it's a, the Hebrew hymn book. And if you think memorizing uh, the, verse, <laughs> the verse of memory verse is tough, just imagine that all the Hebrew children as they were growing up were memorizing the Hebrew hymn book. You say, what? And I'm thinking to myself, they would say, we're only going to sing part of what we know today as Psalm 119. Can you imagine? Okay, kids, come on up, and we're going to sing Psalm 119 in its entirety for the folks here at the, at the temple. And they're going... Oh, no, I, I, was, I was hoping we wouldn't get to Psalm 119 until I got sick or something. But those people had trained their children up to memorize, if not all, most of the psalms that we read. So whenever you have homework assignments the rest of the school year, your parents are going to have like zero sympathy when you say, I don't think I can memorize that. Because you'll just hear your parents say, Remember the Hebrew children? Remember what they had to, to memorize? So just kind of forget it. No sympathy here. But <clears throat> the people who are in charge of <clears throat> music, according to what we see here, there's somebody here in Chenaniah, chief of the Levites, was for song. He instructed about the song. Why? What does the verse say? The last, what is it, four words? Because, the last three words? <clears throat> he was skillful. So he, he instructed about the song because he was skillful. So the person who is in charge of the service of song uh, should be someone who's in tune spiritually with the Lord. Because I'll say it perhaps more than once, there's more to church music than just mechanics and talent. There's a whole lot more to it than that. So they should have discernment in choosing scripturally sound lyrics that's the words and what we call musical styling there's a whole lot to say about musical styling and i think i'll say just a little bit about it now i don't want to chew my cabbage twice through through the whole message here but musical styling is is uh, really simple to understand if we realize that everything that we sing and everything we say is going to be either Christocentric or egocentric. In other words, one of the songs on the, uh, on the CD is really a prayer to God. And those of you who have the CD, it's called More of You. And in our, in our Christian walk, we ought to be thinking that our life should be more about the Lord more of you, Lord, more of your influence in my life, Lord, and less of me, less of me. In other words, I don't want to be an egocentric Christian. I want to be a Christocentric Christian, and that would include music. So the idea of styling, I think we're pretty well aware of the fact that there, there are two ways of, quote, singing Christian music, and, and one of them is called 
performance. Performance. I, I cringe if anybody ever says, <clears throat> when I'm in a church, we're going to have uh, Pastor Schaefer come up at this time, and he's going to perform one of the songs on his CD. I, I, I cringe just to think about it. Because uh, I've never, to my knowledge, performed a, a Christian song in my life. Because the performance is the basic musical styling of the world. That's performance. And they literally base how well they do on how well they perform the song. There, there are ways to sing songs that will elicit certain emotional responses. And if the goal of the song is to elicit an emotional response, and that's the primary thing, then it's really the performance styling of the world. Now, the other side is this idea of a message in song that is presented, a message presented in song. Once again, the CD has songs that are messages in song. Those of you who have had time to actually listen to all of the songs, realize there's a message that speaks to our heart. Now, it primarily is a message in song that is exalting the Lord Jesus Christ in many different aspects, the cross, and so on and so forth. And so it is meant to lift up Christ and be instructive to you. And the, the reality is when I hear it, it does bring tears to my eyes. It does. And I'm the one who sang it. But the reality is that's not the purpose to bring tears to your eyes or to my eyes. But the emphasis is to be, are you thinking about Christ? Are you praising God in your heart because of the things that are presented in song that remind you of what Jesus Christ has done in your life? So you have two forms of musical styling, basically. The one is performance-based, where somebody gets up and their styling is very similar to the way the world sings their songs. And in a very real sense, and I'm using that term specifically, it can be sensual. In other words, the main goal is to appeal to the flesh, to appeal to the flesh. So that's the idea of performance-based, uh, quote, Christian music, what's called CCM, contemporary Christian music, a lot, of, a lot of that musical styling uh, is an exhibition of the talents of the individual, and usually they're, they're professionals, they're getting paid for singing and so forth, and their talents are on display. Well, that's not what Christian music is supposed to be all about. It's supposed to be done skillfully, but not to the point where all the things that will appeal to the senses are checked off, the boxes are all checked, so that that song, when it's performed by the world, is going to elicit a response. And it's not necessarily to lift up Christ, it's a matter of making people feel a certain way. So it's sensually based, it's performance based. The other side, of course, is the presentation of a message in song. So there has to be a message in the song to begin with. And the idea of uh, repetitive uh, uh, songs and choruses is relatively new, relatively new. Sometimes people will point at, well, there are some places in, in the scripture that, that there are repetitive. Uh, this saying seems like it's saying the same thing. But uh, most of you who have ever heard any of the music of the world, Christian music of the world, you can tell a difference. You can tell a difference. Now, <clears throat> we're moving on. They, they should have discernment. Folks should have discernment in choosing scripturally sound lyrics and musical styling. And they should know what they're looking for, which means you basically have to do some research. And as I mentioned, <clears throat> there is so much online by good, good teachers. If I mention some of their names, you would probably uh, know who they are. 
but just excellent teachers. Sometimes they can go so deep in the philosophy, they, they can lose you maybe a little bit. And uh, sometimes it's, it's just decrying all that's terrible and awful in music. But I think we really ought to emphasize the positive side. Uh, you know, they, they say when you're looking for counterfeit money, uh, the people who really search out counterfeit money don't, don't, don't uh, test themselves and quiz themselves on looking at different types of counterfeit money. Anybody know what they really do? They're making sure that they know exactly what the real thing looks like. And they are so well versed in what the real money looks like that whenever they spot anything that's different from that, they know it's a counterfeit. And so the idea is know, know what the Bible is saying. So we look now at 1 Chronicles chapter 25 as we move along. <clears throat> 1 Chronicles chapter 25. And it's talking about a particular family. And it says in 1 Chronicles 25, if you're there, verse number 6 says this. All these, all these, all these people were under the hands of their father for song in the house of the Lord. You'll say it's kind of a big family. Well, yeah, but they've got extra people here too. So, song in the house of the Lord. They were under the hand of their father for song in the house of the Lord with cymbals, psalteries, and harps for the service, once again that word service, of the house of God, according to the king's order to Asaph, Jeduthun, and Heman. So, the number of them, including with their brethren, that were instructed in the songs of the Lord, even all that were, if you're following along, next word please, even all that were cunning was 200, four score, and eight. And some people will say, wow, 288 people uh, in the choir, perhaps. And that is definitely uh, one uh, one interpretation, I happen to agree with it, which of course makes it, you know, questionable. But uh, it, it rises and falls all the time, music does, on leadership. And you hear it. Everything rises and falls on, mu on, um, on leadership, and uh, music is really no exception. So if the music leader has a showboat personality and lacks humility... Uh, those things will show themselves in the spirit and the attitude of the singers and the songs that are sung. Now, you say, well, that was kind of a firm grasp of the obvious, wasn't it, preacher? Well, I'm just telling you, in a lot of churches, it's not a firm grasp of the obvious. <clears throat> the idea of humility, when I get up here to, to preach, I'm not up here to say, oh, I'm going to tell you all the things that I've learned in my life. I've forgotten 80% of what I've ever learned, so you're just getting whatever is left that I can still remember that the Lord brings to my memory. The idea is we have to come here with the idea, I have nothing except what the Lord gives me, and what God works through me is the only thing that's worth anything. So when we look at this, always remember about whom you are singing and to whom you are primarily singing, because that's Christocentric music. We're singing to Christ, we're singing about Christ, and that's what the theme of all, all the songs are supposed to be. Now, evidently, I'm led to say what I'm about to say because it, the Lord just put it into my mind. Uh, when you read the Psalms, the Hebrew songbook, you'll find out there's a lot of personal testimonies there. You'll find out personal testimonies abound in the Hebrew songbook. And there are a lot of prayers that are written out in those psalms, the Hebrew songbook. So <clears throat> some of the songs that are uh, on the CD that I sang, they are, they're prayer songs. One of them is, when you pray, pray for America. But it's not just a, quote, political song. It's a matter of God has promised to listen to the prayers of a righteous man. And it's trying to call us to being righteous people who, when we pray, God is able to hear us. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The rest don't get past the ceiling. And that's, that's the reality. 
So church music should never be about you. It should never be about me as the, the singer or even if there's a, a special music that is a piano, a piano special. It should never be about the talents that the singers and the, the uh, people on instruments have. It, that's egocentric music. And if you can train yourself to be aware of egocentric music, uh, it's pretty easy. Holy Spirit of God, is this a song that I should sing? I'm yielding myself to you to give me the answer. Even though, as I think I looked at the first or second night, uh, my prayer sounds like it makes perfect sense to me. I think this is a great song. I'd love to sing this song. And sometimes I've, I've definitely heard the Lord telling me, I, I'm glad that you enjoy it so much, but that's not what you're going to sing. It's just not going to be what you sing. And so that's the way it works. So as we, as we move along, and I'm, I'm sparing you some of this massive information, but humility is needed in every aspect of the local church, and the music uh, is not exempt from that. Our, our spiritual lives, when we think about the philosophy of music, <clears throat> how would you like to have some uh, uh, drunken person get up and, and preach a message to you, or have some drunken person kind of hang on to the pulpit and, and sing a song that's going to bless your heart? Or someone that you know, oh, wait a minute, that, that guy is a politician. And it could be anybody, but it's a politician who embezzled money from the citizenry. And he's up here, and, and he's going to preach a message from God's word. Uh, what would you say? I think it would go something like this. It ain't going to happen. Did I say it succinctly? <laughs> It ain't going to happen. Because why? God will not bless, nor will God use a dirty vessel. If there's something wrong with you spiritually and you're, you know, you're contemplating sin and you're thinking about it, <clears throat> is God going to hear your prayer when you pray? Is he going to bless what you do? A lot of people say, well, maybe he would be able to bless in spite of it. Well, let's just ask the question. Would you rather have God bless this church in spite of the church members or because the church members want to be pure before God? I think the answer is pretty simple. So when there's a, and I'm going to say it just this way, when there is a lapse, I'm going to say it that way, if a, if a choir member, I don't know if you have a choir or not, but you have, if you have choir members or if you have special music people who sing, but their life slips spiritually. It's time to counsel with them, ask them to sit out of special music until things are spiritually in order again. Because you don't want any hindrances to the Spirit of God working in the Lord's church. Can we get an amen on that? Yeah. All right? So, Bringing back the glory to church music takes commitment and spiritual accountability. And it's one of the reasons why, and I'm just going to state it, it's one of the reasons why the glory has departed in many churches today. <clears throat> now, those of you who have uh, little children's records know that when you hear the little bell ring, it's time to turn the page. So we're moving now to the purpose of scriptural music. See, it's like just incorporate things into the, into the message. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, if you'll turn there, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14. And what we're going to read is, of course, from the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. <clears throat> and we're going to see two things specifically mentioned here. <clears throat> and uh, I'd like to ask you to, to look for these two things. They're in reference uh, to music. And they are really the two major elements 
that the Apostle Paul is pointing out to the local church at Corinth. So you notice when we're reading these New Testament scriptures, uh, these admonitions and uh, these warnings that we'll go through, uh, they're to local churches. And so they apply to this church because this is also a local church. This is one of the Lord's churches just as much as the church at Corinth was one of the Lord's churches. So we can take this personally as a church family. As this church family reads this verse in your mind as I'm reading it aloud, this is for you. So here's what he says. What is it then? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. Full stop for a moment and just, just look up. We would all agree with that, would we not? You know, we need to pray in the Spirit, but not so spiritually like they were thinking they were doing in, church, in the church at Corinth that they didn't even understand what they were saying. He said, I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. But then he finishes off what we call verse 15, I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. So the idea is when we are singing, there are two elements here. And as long as we have an understanding of the message of the song we sing, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I don't know about you, but I've heard so-called Christian songs, and I could not quite grasp what the message was that they were singing about. Just saying. I, I, had, I ask my wife sometimes, um, am I just off a little bit today? Or I didn't get that. And she said, maybe, maybe you're off a little bit, but I must be also. So I didn't get it either. The song is sung. And we ended up coming to the conclusion it was very pretty music. It was very pretty music. I asked my wife, did you understand what those last words the person was singing? Because it ended up going from what I call full throttle to a whisper. And it was like, I, I guess I missed those last ones. Maybe I've got to turn the volume up for the last couple words of the song. So we need to have an understanding of the message of the song that's being sung. And we are to be singing in the spirit, it's listed here as, I will sing with the spirit. It's with, by, and in. Same basic uh, Greek word that's translated those three different words. And it helps us to understand. We're supposed to be singing with the spirit. In the spirit. With the spirit, meaning the spirit of God is working in me as I'm singing this song. Paul said, I don't want to sing just a pretty song. Tinkling cymbals, etc., etc. No matter what it's all about. I want to make sure I'm singing in the spirit. Otherwise, what's the purpose of the music if the message cannot be understood? Amen? I mean, that's that uh, we would say once again, well, Brother Schaefer, you're just nailing all these firm grasp of the obvious. Well, in many places, it's just not a firm uh, grasp of the music. Now, of the obvious. <clears throat> what's the purpose of music in a church? I'm going to just state it. We use music... We use music to prepare the hearts of those listening to get something out of, the, out of the message. How many times have you heard that? All right, I would agree basically with the statement. We do use music. One of the things, one of the things that we use music for is to help prepare the hearts of those listening to get something out of the message that's going to follow. But I want to just kind of go just a little bit uh, into detail, just to say, okay, well, is there any biblical support for that? Because I think many of you would say you have heard songs, sometimes they're while you're on the way to church. Perhaps you have a car that still has a CD player in it, or maybe a chip that you've downloaded all the music in the world onto, and you listen to, to godly music on the way to church, and you sense within yourself, this is helping me to be spiritually minded. 
It's a whole lot better to be listening to, to godly, Christ-honoring music on the way to church than arguing with your spouse on the way to church. Not that you have to have music on in order to keep you from arguing with your wife, but it helps to settle your thoughts as you're coming to church. If you don't, that's, <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes I don't have any music on on my way to church. I'm just concentrating on, uh, I want the Lord to either use me or if I'm hearing somebody else, I want the Lord to open my spirit so that I'm open to what's being preached. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, <clears throat> let's look at, at this passage. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, it is written to a local church. Where is that church? In the, in the city of Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 5, and let's, let's just roll with this. Ephesians 5 and verse 19, the Bible says this, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, what some people have said is this, uh, the music doesn't help prepare your hearts to receive the message because the music that you're singing is entire, entirely to the Lord. And I, I've had actually somebody say, Can, can't you see this, Brother Schaefer? It, the emphasis is that we're making melody in our hearts to the Lord. To which I would say, when you look at this verse... There are two components, and it's in just my, my opinion, that both of the components are screaming at us. This is written to the local church at Ephesus, and it says, speaking to yourselves. Now, when you look it up, the word yourselves can mean you by yourself, singular, but it can also mean among yourselves, number being plural. So for someone to say, well, it can't mean plural. It's just talking about all of us as individual people. We're supposed to speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs because we're singing and making melody in our heart just to the Lord. However, this verse is stating two things that can be accomplished at the same time with music. We say, well, how do we know that? Because of historical statements that back up the idea that these people did the same thing that we did at the beginning of this service. What did we do? We were speaking to ourselves, plural, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And at the same time, we were singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord. Two components being accomplished at the same time. And how many of you would say uh, that particular song, that particular hymn that we sang, spiritual songs, hymns, spoke to my heart? How many people have ever said that? That, that spoke to my heart. That's happened to me over the now decades uh, that I've been saved. And so when we think about, yes, one of the things, one of the components of music in the church, the Lord's churches, is that it does help prepare our hearts to receive the message that's going to follow. It's not the only thing that it accomplishes, but it is definitely one of the things that it accomplishes. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, I believe it's a little bit somewhat, and I'd say somewhat clearer, <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, you have the similar idea. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now, this is written in such a way that the statement is made and then an explanation of how it can be done follows. So notice as it says it, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. How do we do that? Teaching and admonishing one another. Teaching one another. Okay, so we have Sunday school classes 
and we have the, the preaching of God's word, and we're, we're teaching God's word. We open it up, and we're like, we're reading these verses tonight. So we're teaching, and we're admonishing one another. But it goes on, doesn't it? It says, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So what do we see here? Oh, you mean that when we are singing these psalms and hymns and spiritual songs that at the same time we're teaching and admonishing one another that's exactly what it's telling us so so music in the lord's church can be and according to colossians 3 16 should be helping to teach and admonish us so there is teaching that can be accomplished admonishing us to do good works for the Lord, for each other, and so forth. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, the reason why I said this is a little more obvious, it's saying singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. There is the heart component. We're going to love the Lord with all of our heart, strength, mind, and so forth. And when we're singing, we're singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. When we sing, we are singing to the Lord, but when we're singing the words to the psalms, the hymns, and the spiritual songs, we are, as a group, teaching and admonishing each other with these, with these songs. <clears throat> Isaiah 51, 11, that we looked at, <clears throat> is doing something to help us. And uh, uh, Psalm there we go. Click, click, click. Say it again. There we go. Psalm 92, verses 1 through 4. What is it doing? It's admonishing us that it's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. It's never a bad time to give thanks unto the Lord. Got the idea? And that's, that's what we're thinking. Use, use every scriptural thing that's, that's uh, at your disposal, according to Psalm whatever that was, 92 verses 1 through 4. Use everything that's at your disposal to, to get the job done of doing what the Bible's saying. Teach and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's one of the things that's so scriptural that none of us can say, oh no, I don't think we should be teaching using songs to teach anything. Well, we do it all the time. I understand that 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 uh, David, when he was just kind of a small lad, uh, <clears throat> took five stones and put one of them in a sling. And from what I remember, the Bible says that the sling went round and round. And then when he let go of the sling, uh, it hit the giant. And from what I remember, uh, I think it was straight out of the Hebrew, and the giant came tumbling down, something like that, all right? So we teach our children with songs, and we think many times, and it is, they're cute. Those are cute songs. But at the same time, when we're singing the, quote, grown-up songs, we need to be listening to what we're singing. Because there's a message in every one of these uh, songs that we're singing. So half the verse in Colossians 3.16 is directing our teaching and admonishing in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another, and then the second half is addressing our heart attitude toward God. So when we get together and, and you sing your uh, opening songs, what we call congregational songs, keep in mind that the reason why we're doing them, the reason why we're singing them, is really in obedience to Colossians 3.16. Mm -hmm. Allow the word of Christ to dwell in you richly in all wisdom, Take every opportunity you can to teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Why? It doesn't state it, but here it is. The musical side of teaching and admonition helps to reinforce the teaching and the preaching of God's word. The musical component helps us so much. That's why it's, it's so easy to remember our songs, a lot of songs. And so, unfortunately, before I was saved, I remember a lot of songs before I was saved. But fortunately, 
I remember a lot of songs after I'm saved, after I was saved, that are spiritual songs and have helped me to grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So in Psalm 9, Psalm 9, verse 11, the Bible says, and this is in the Old Testament, of course, the book of Psalms, Psalm 9, the ninth Psalm, the 11th verse says this, notice, sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Okay, that's what we're doing. We're just singing praises to the Lord. We're not singing them to anybody else. We're just singing them to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. But part of the statement in the Hebrew as well as in the, in the English is saying that something else is happening at the same time. See if you can see it. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. Thank you, Lord. You took the army of Egypt and you drowned them in the Red Sea. Praise the Lord. <laughs> what did that psalm teach the children of Israel? We got a great God. He did what no other God has ever done. He opened the Red Sea and allowed us to pass over. And when, when Pharaoh's army came through, the song says something like, Pharaoh's army got drowned. Somebody's not supposed to weep. And it's basically taken from the, the book of Psalms. So the idea is, yeah, we're singing praises to the Lord. What a great and wonderful God, what he's done. And we're telling everybody while we're singing to the Lord that we ought to be praising the Lord for all of the good things God has done. Psalm 92, verses 1 through 4 again. God's a, a wonderful God. It's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. So when we're looking at these things, it helps us to realize there are lots of different purposes of worship, and, or excuse me, purposes for the Word of God. We're going to go through them very quickly, number one, the purpose of worship. And you can jot these passages down if you'd like. Second Chronicles chapter 29, verse 28, and I'll read it. And all the congregation worshipped, and the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded. And all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. Talk about a long offertory. That's exactly, it took a long time. So in addition to saying that singing was a part of the worship, does not mean that the people listening to the music were totally unaffected. Because after all, it was only a part of the worship of God. No, when we sing congregational singing, we can worship the Lord and speak to each other at the same time. Secondly, the purpose of thanks, which goes along with Psalm 147, verse 7. Psalm 147, verse 7. The purpose of music, part of it is the purpose of thanks. Psalm 147, verse 7 says this. Sing unto the Lord with, if you've got it, what's the next word? Thanksgiving. <clears throat> Sing praise upon the harp unto our God. Psalm 147. Verse 7. And then, by the way, it is okay to get happy when you're singing. Because in Psalm 98, verses 4 and 5, I want to see if you can do this without getting happy about doing what the Bible says here. Psalm 98, verses 4 and 5. The purpose of rejoicing, all right? Purpose of music is part of it is rejoicing. Well, here it is, Psalm 98, verses 4 and 5. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. A joyful sound, a joyful noise unto the Lord. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of a psalm. Have you ever tried to be joyful without being happy? Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. 
I'm so happy and here's the reason why. Jesus took my burden all away. So there. But it's kind of hard to do that, isn't it? As soon as you start singing, <laughs> it was one of those unintentional, it was funny, but it wasn't intentional. The idea is, <laughs> folks, as soon as you start singing, I'm so happy and here's the reason why. Jesus took my burdens all away. Now I'm singing as the days go by. Jesus took my burdens all away. How many of you wanted to sing, fill in those parts? Okay, oh, yeah. yeah. You, it it kind of likes, <clears throat> it, it can help you be happy. Why? Because one of the purposes of music is rejoicing. That's why there are certain songs, there's a couple of the songs, I sing because, on the CD, I'm not advertising, the, I sing because there is an empty grave. I sing because there is a power that saves. I sing because his grace is real to me. Those are the words to the song. I can't help but get happy when I'm singing those songs. They're rejoicing songs. Then number four, the purpose of consecration. Consecration is really, it's really all about setting yourself apart to serve the Lord and making sure that you are in a right relationship with the Lord so that you can serve him with a pure heart. In Psalm uh, 139, verse 23, there is a song about it. It's written, but Psalm 39, verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And so there's a song, and it's just called, it's either Search Me or Search Me, and then in, sometimes in parenthesis, Search Me, O God. And some of you, the words and the music are coming to your mind. Search me, O God, and know my heart. They add a word today. Okay? Try me, know my thoughts today, I pray. And so in uh, Psalm 111, verse 1, the Bible says, Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. I'm going to praise the Lord with my whole heart. With all that in me is, praise the Lord. So there's an element in music that it has a purpose of consecration. Then fifth, the purpose of edification. To edify basically means that members of the church are building up and strengthening one another in the most holy faith. That's why music that is sung that is in agreement with what has been preached from God's word is so helpful because it backs up the preaching of the word of God rather than put, putting questions in people's minds. Wait a minute, that's not what we heard preached. So that's why it's so important to have um, music that's going to be edifying and supporting and strengthening the people. In Colossians 3 and verse 16, we looked at this before, let the word of God or let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The sixth purpose is the purpose of evangelism, which sometimes we get gets missed, but there's a lot of good uh, music, good music, that is good for evangelism. It goes along with Psalm 40, verse 3, which says this, And he hath put a new song in my mouth, which begs the question, why is there a new song in your heart, in your mouth? Well, it's even praise unto our God. Well, why would you want to do that? Many sh because many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. That's why I mentioned this morning, the way our lives are lived are either attracting people to the Savior or repelling them from the Savior. And so the idea of the purpose of evangelism <clears throat> He hath put a new song in my mouth, but unfortunately, many times it never gets out of our mouth. And we never sing these praises unto our God. Because if, they're, if we're singing praises unto the Lord, then and only then will many see it and fear, which means be in awe. What has happened to, you, to your life? What has changed in your life that has made you so different? And then the purpose of preservation of faith. 
which the purpose of music, one of the purposes is the preservation of faith. In other words, in psalms and hymns and all these spiritual songs, you're teaching the faith of our Baptist Christian forefathers. <clears throat> and we see that in Psalm 145, verses 4 and 5, which read at thusly, One generation shall praise thy works to another. Everybody got it? One generation shall praise thy works to another. In other words, this is the way it's supposed to be done. And shall declare thy mighty acts. We're declaring the miraculous acts of God from the past, but the mighty acts of the Lord in the present. Always feel free to give God the credit for extreme coincidence in your life. Don't be afraid to say, you know, maybe God's in that. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah. Maybe the only way it could have happened is for God to intervene. Oh, what a coincidence that was. Oh, no. Be, be quick to say, oh, no, that's not a coincidence. That was God working. We prayed for that, and the Lord was answering our prayers. It's not a coincidence. It's answered prayer. And so it says, I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy <clears throat> wondrous works. And the Hebrew songbook has preserved a belief system for centuries. And it's right in our Bibles. <clears throat> and we can actually use it too. And next time on Skype, we'll just teach another song. That's the easiest way to teach songs. Just do it on Skype. <clears throat> so when we're looking at the purpose of music... I believe that we should be constantly examining what we do as far as church music is concerned and comparing it to what the Bible has to say. Now, when, when I say that, <clears throat> I have to add a caveat. I would agree with what I just told you. And if we find that there is nothing unscriptural about what is being done in the local church, we should be willing to let it go, even if it's different than what our preference would be. I have found out since I've been alive that I don't always get what I prefer. Have you noticed that in your own life? We don't always get what we prefer. Sometimes we get something else, and sometimes we're surprised. That is, it's okay. So as long as we spend as much time reaching out to the lost as we do discussing the music in the church, I don't have a problem with it. It's when m music ends up being so important that we forget that it is part of the service in the Lord's house. It's the service of song. Did you know that Paul was not called to, to baptize, but to preach the gospel? And if you'll notice, he also wasn't called to the service of song. His calling was different. Everyone in this church, believe it or not, if the Lord has placed you as a member in this church, there is a service that you are to do for this body of Christ. If you're a member... You're as just as much a member of this church body as my fingers are members to my body. They, you have a purpose. You have a purpose. Well, preacher, I, I, can't, I can't do much. You know, my baby toe doesn't really do much, but when it hurts, uh, I can't do much either. And the whole body needs to be working together uh, to bring glory to the Lord. In the area of music, uh, I only have one other message left, but I think I'm just going to give that to the pastor and he can preach it the next time and just, uh, just finish it up. It's what does music do to you? And so I do want to, seriously, I do want to give that to you. <clears throat> and uh, if you want, you can just say, hey, would you go on Skype and just preach that message? And I'd be willing to do that too.
But I'm hoping that this basic, it's really just the basic philosophy of music. I didn't go into, if you ever hold a microphone to sing special music, there's the world's performance way of holding a microphone. How many of you are aware of that? And there's a presentation of a message way of holding a microphone that makes you not even realize the person's holding a microphone. Just briefly, why would you want to caress a microphone? <laughs> Unless you were wanting to bring attention to the microphone and to yourself. That was an easy illustration, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Whereas, if a microphone's on a stand and you're standing behind it, <clears throat> it's not the focus of attention. It ends up being the message that comes into the microphone and comes through the speakers. That was the practical illustration, <clears throat> but that's it uh, for tonight. And so you have several things that are really philosophies of music, philosophies of service in song. And so ask the Lord, what part does he want you to accomplish? You may be one of those that is meant to listen to the music and listen for the message in the music. Otherwise, you cannot be, uh, you cannot be instructed and admonished if you don't hear and understand the message in song. And if anything, I definitely want to leave you with that. Pretty music is pretty music, but you might as well just, just be driving down the road and have it as the background, pretty music, because it's not really teaching you much. But try to understand what the message is in every song that you hear and think about the message when you sing. Because the longer you're saved, the tendency is to listen less and less to the congregational songs that you sing. All right? Let's all stand, if you would, please. I appreciate your kind attention this evening. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for the, the word that we were able to share from your holy word. And Lord, we ask that you would take what was said and obviously in this group of people, there are, are many different ways that the message can be applied. And so each person knows their own spirit and, and what was said that was speaking to them. And so I ask, Lord, that you would help those who have had perhaps a nonchalant attitude about how important music is or how unimportant it is to them. Help them to realize the scriptural importance uh, that was presented this evening, and then, Lord, may we do our best as we serve in song, if we're involved in the service of song, and, Lord, for everyone here, help us to be willing and wanting to be instructed and admonished by the music that we hear. Help us to choose the music that would draw us toward Christ and a love for him, and help us to re be repelled away from the type of music that does not draw us toward a closer relationship with Christ. And we'll thank you for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As the accompanist plays and... Thank you.
Okay.